All right, city manager, we good? Okay. Yes, uh, we are good, and we are ready to begin when you are. Okay. So we'll go now officially call the San Bernardino City Council special meeting of March the 2nd, 2021 to order. May we please have roll call. Council Member Hamilton? Here. Council Member Mason? Here. Council Member Salazar? Here. Vice Mayor Marty Medina? Here. Mayor Rico Medina? Here. Thank you very much. Now we'll uh, public comments for items not on the agenda. Is there anybody uh, wishing to speak on items not on the agenda for this? Seeing no hands at this moment. Uh, we'll move on to the study session is why we're here is to receive draft user fee update presentation and provide direction to staff. I will turn it over to the city manager, please. Okay, uh, thank you, council. I will share uh, the screen. Let's begin from the beginning. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay, so uh, good evening, uh, city council, Devon Grogan, city manager. Uh, I'm joined uh, tonight uh, by a host of characters. Uh, so one is Craig Whittem, uh, a management consulting consultant from MRG. Uh, the council will remember uh, Craig Whittem uh, is the uh, former assistant uh, city manager in Vallejo, uh, who is now a consultant. Uh, and he helped us out, uh, or has been helping us out uh, with a analysis of the community and economic development uh, department. Uh, when uh, our finance director uh, transitioned, uh, one of the projects our finance director was leading was this master fee update. Uh, I asked uh, Craig Woodham to step in and project manage uh, this to completion. And uh, Craig has done an excellent job at that. Uh, and that is largely the reason why we are here today uh, with uh, providing recommendations and having this detailed study session on updating our user fees. Um, I'll also say at a high level, it is um, uh, important that we got to this point because uh, as you'll see in the presentation, our user fees and the data that went into this study are based on our cost. Every year our costs change. And so if we do not, um, uh, if we didn't finalize the report now uh, and we waited until next fiscal year, we would be updating uh, the, the data yet again um, based on new costs in the new fiscal year. And so closing this out this year uh, is important from a time and a process perspective. Uh, we also have Tony Thrasher uh, from Wildan, uh, our consultant that actually performed the fee study. Uh, and then we have uh, nearly all of our department directors here um, uh, uh, participating, uh, ready to answer any questions uh, because our fee categories span across all of our departments. So our objective uh, for tonight's study session is to uh, receive council input and direction. Uh, we have a draft cost recovery policy that uh, was described in detail in the staff report and we will review uh, at a higher level here in the presentation. Uh, but that policy is key because it's essentially uh, the city's um, uh, governing policy on how fees are set. Uh, and all of this is geared toward the new fees taking effect July 1, 2021. So the outline of our presentation is as follows. Uh, we will provide some background on uh, the user fee update project. We will uh, provide a, the draft uh, cost recovery policy. And then we'll talk about uh, user fees in a few categories um, uh, we'll, we'll do a deep dive on community service, community services fees, so our park, recreation, and library fees, because uh, we are recommending a, a, um, a change to that model and how we charge those fees and how we set them. Uh, we will also talk about some of the most common fees and uh, provide a comparison to other cities. As a note, um, when you set fees, they're based on your cost. But it's also important just to do a quick scan and, and see where, where your uh, neighboring cities lie. Um, we'll talk about some new fees. We'll talk about the concept of fully burdened rate and, and what that means. We'll sort of we'll go down a couple rabbit holes and, and pull us up if we need to. Okay, let's provide a little background. Um, so uh, annual fee setting process. So uh, members of the city council that, are, uh, uh, that have been on the council for a while or uh, members of the community. Um, you'll know that we, were, we typically review our fees every year during the annual budgeting process. 
However, what we have not done here, and I would say we missed three cycles of this, um, uh, most cities have a practice of updating their fees and doing a comprehensive update every five years. Uh, our last comprehensive update of our fees uh, were in 20, uh, 2005, 2016 fiscal year. So we're nearly 15 or 16 years behind updating our fees. And so our fees have not kept pace with the cost of our services. And, 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 and we know that in a couple of different ways because um, uh, we know that we are subsidizing a number of our services to a greater degree uh, than some of our, our neighboring municipalities. Uh, and uh, we, we have often talked about uh, the charges in development review uh, and how our charges are less than uh, what, a, uh, what the same developer would pay uh, in, in just a neighboring city over. Uh, and so it's important to uh, re-baseline our fees so that we're covering our costs. Um, user fees fund city services. Uh, not all city services are paid by general tax dollars. That's important. And so we'll talk about public benefit versus private benefit and how uh, your fee policy will really uh, set how much you want to subsidize services that have a public good, a, a significant public benefit, versus how much you want to subsidize services that have a private benefit, i.e. benefiting one particular private property owner versus um, uh, uh, other fees. We, we know, we recognize it is never a good time uh, to, to increase fees. No one ever wants to increase fees, uh, probably why they haven't been increased in 15 years. Um, and we do not bring this recommendation to you um, uh, uh, lightly. Uh, but one of the things we know is that uh, when the fees do not keep pace with the cost of services, really three things occur. You increase the city subsidy, both for public and private benefit services. That either results in a drawdown of your reserves or uh, it limits funding for other activities, and, and we know that very well because as our costs have increased, uh, we've had to make strategic budget decisions because we haven't increased our fees on what we're not going to do or what what essentially uh, falls on the cutting room floor during budget time because money, is, money that would go to fund that service is, is going elsewhere. Uh, again, when you don't increase your fees, um, you end up reducing services, personnel, or other expenses. Um, uh, to account for that revenue shortfall. And so essentially you do more with less um, uh, or you, you cut in other areas because you, you, you haven't an increased the fee. Um, and then what we also uh, know is that when you don't have a regular occurrence of increasing your fees, your, your future fee increases typically need to be larger to catch up. Uh, and you're, all, you're sometimes actually paying more for the deferred maintenance uh, because you didn't uh, budget over time to save for those. Um, and it's also sort of globally important to note that we can affect how much we charge. Well, the piece of the equation on expenditures, oftentimes we have almost no control over a lot of those costs. We are not on an island. Our costs go up um, for uh, um, uh, regular expenditures, uh, contract expenditures, uh, and even our personnel costs uh, go up, driven by factors that we don't control. And so that, unfortunately, that happens every year, and we can work at being more efficient, we can make strategic decisions, but one thing is true is that we cannot stop costs from going up. And so when costs go up, we have to make a decision on do we increase the revenue or do we uh, keep the revenue stagnant and uh, make other, uh, other decisions to pull in other areas. Another sort of global comment uh, about our fee setting is that we must comply with state law. Uh, at a high level, state law says that we cannot charge more than the cost reasonably borne. What does that mean? That means for the vast majority of our fees, we cannot charge more than our cost, which is why we uh, and other cities employ the services of a consultant to do a fee study, um, such as the one you have before you, to defend the, uh, our cost, to identify what is our total uh, re reimbursable cost, and then we can charge that amount or less than that amount. A caveat to that is that we are allowed to charge fees that are higher than our cost when we're not the sole provider of that service. service. Classic uh, is uh, swim lessons. Uh, we are not the only provider of swim lessons, so we could actually charge the market rate for swim lessons. Now, governments typically don't because they view that there's a public good for swim lessons. What we can't charge more than our cost for is a permit. We cannot 
because we are the only one that can provide that permit uh, uh, and there's not a, a, a private market alternative. So that's just a high level of uh, how these fees are structured. And if you remember those two things, you have the, you have the background that you need. Um, so what also, what are, we, what are we not talking about? We're not talking about here our enterprise fees. So we're not talking about water rates, sewer rates, stormwater rates, or even city net charges. Uh, we're talking about fees, and they really fall into three primary buckets. Development review fees. Now, development review is not a term that we use a lot publicly, but when we say development review, we mean planning fees, building fees, public works encroachment fees, um, fire marshal fees, because uh, our fire department goes out and inspects buildings. Um, and those all relate to what we call under the umbrella of development review. It has something to do with a building or property and, and physical work being done. The next category of fees are program or service fees, aquatics, rec programs, library fees, et cetera, uh, camp fees. The third bucket of fees are operational fees. So these are processing charges, copying charges, a live scan fee for a thumbprint at the police department, things like that. Uh, and so those are the three buckets of the fees that we're talking about today. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, I, I think, helpful grounding for, for our conversation. All right, last part of our intro is to talk about our comprehensive fiscal uh, sustainability project. Um, council and the public will remember this because this is the same chart that we provided in, oh my God, November of 2018. Uh, when we kicked off this project. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, we're more than two years in and we're, we're at the top where it says long-term strategies. Uh, and we've had a lot of successes. Uh, and in many ways, this project is not over. And so we, uh, for our budget process, will work on an update to this. Uh, but we launched this comprehensive fiscal uh, sustainability project because we recognize that um, uh, there was some significant risk to the general fund. And so let's take a moment to re recap some of those and understand how this important project fits in. And so at a high level, what are some of our accomplishments? Uh, and some of these include things that were triggered by COVID-19 because this was a living and breathing uh, project and we had to adapt due to COVID-19. So some of our revenue enhancement measures, uh, our, our measures that we took before the voters. So uh, three measures in the last um, uh, roughly uh, 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 two years, um, two and a half years. Um, measure G, um, bringing in 5.5 to $4 million. The 4 million is the pre-COVID number. The 5.5 is roughly what it's bringing in uh, while we're in COVID. Our TOT or hotel room tax increase uh, going from 12% to 14% pre-COVID projected to bring in about $500,000 uh, with, with our, our hotel room charges being essentially uh, 25 to 30 percent of what they were, uh, that's a lot less. And then our marijuana tax that you, you guys all know about, providing the city with the option to tax marijuana should, should it be legalized. Adoption of development impact fees, a, a, a very important project that we embarked on in, uh, and, and completed uh, in 2019 uh, to have um, market-based development impact fees under a number of buckets. I won't go into this, but I know council knows how important having those development impact fees are. Uh, and, and as projects develop, uh, we have a number of projects that are actually getting ready to pay those fees. Uh, and, and so that will provide needed money to improve our infrastructure, actually critical. Uh, our walmart.com sales tax sharing agreement projected to bring in uh, 3.65 million a year. Uh, we've negotiated uh, development related community benefit agreements. One is the uh, development agreement extension for 1400 and 1450 Bay Hill that the city council approved uh, late in 2020. And YouTube has already made that $4.5 million payment. Uh, the Mills Park VA uh, uh, had a guaranteed $10 million um, uh, community benefit. Uh, that project has not um, uh, begun construction yet. They are developing their construction diagrams but the community benefit agreement that we negotiated had a $10 million payment. Expenditure controls, um, uh, budgetary and uh, personnel cost containment, 
we've we've done that uh, for for the last two two, uh, two plus years. Um, uh, while we were engaged in the comprehensive fiscal sustainability project, I won't talk about all the areas. Uh, we, we renegotiated a number of city net contracts, uh, saving significant um, uh, dollars on how much we pay on a per subscriber basis. Uh, we were faced with over $4 million of mid-year budget shortfalls in 1920, uh, and then an $8.2 million uh, shortfall. Part of that, we used Measure G to cover $2 million, uh, but we provided retirement incentives to decrease our workforce. We froze a number of vacant positions, over 20 uh, uh, positions, and we defunded a number of capital projects, unfortunately. Uh, we also um, have, have a category which is cost shifts or threats to the general fund. There were a number of items that um, were threatening the health of our general fund, and we needed to shift that cost elsewhere. So the conversion of the pg and uh, community service hours uh, to $3 million for the Crestmore Wild Fire Mitigation Project. Uh, our city net uh, programming, we adjusted our programming to, to make uh, our packages um, uh, produce more revenue uh, and no longer be a loss, and we, we adjusted fees. Um, we transitioned our after-school program to the YMCA. That was important uh, from a financial perspective in our community services department um, and from an operational. Uh, and uh, we applied, we're applying for grants, and we recently received a grant to cover a portion of the spyglass uh, stormwater improvements. And so uh, we've done a lot, and the city council should be really proud uh, of this project uh, and all of the uh, um, uh, direction that you have provided. As far as uh, some of the highlights of the ongoing items, the first one up is what we're talking about tonight, uh, enhancing our revenues for those services that depend on our fees. Uh, and that's not to say that we will no longer subsidize services, and, and that's certainly not envisioned in the policy that's before you, uh, but it's to make strategic adjustments on um, uh, what we subsidize. Uh, we are uh, uh, working at uh, liquidating the uh, city site at uh, the crossings development on Admiral Court. Uh, and we are um, in the process or uh, just uh, um, or, 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 or have launched um, community related, uh, a development related community benefit agreements um, and, and negotiations with regard to the Bay Hill specific plan, the Sears redevelopment. South Line that is done by Lane Partners, um, uh, the former uh, Crestmore High School site where the developer uh, 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 of record now is DR Horton and, uh, and Glenview Terrace. And so we are actively engaged uh, with those five projects and uh, community benefit uh, negotiations and conversations right now. Uh, we have continued our budgetary uh, uh, and cost containment controls uh, for both our regular budget and personnel costs. Uh, the council knows that at the mid-year budget, uh, we are uh, approximately $900,000 under at mid-year uh, due to a number of savings, uh, notably in uh, Ann Matola's department, community services. Uh, and we're, uh, we're, we're, we're continuing to address threats to the general fund and shift costs. Uh, and one of those is the current effort that we have with regard to the storm drain and flood protection fee. And then we continue to reposition city net. And so uh, that's sort of the overview. Uh, and the project we're talking about tonight fits squarely in uh, with that comprehensive project. And so uh, I'll turn it over now to Craig Whittem uh, to go through our uh, draft cost recovery policy. Thank you, Javon. And good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Pleasure to be here this evening. Um, I'm going to go through about four slides that highlight what is before you in attachment uh, number one, uh, and that is a draft cost recovery policy. Um, this cost recovery policy, as you know, um, looking through this uh, very long document and a list of uh, more than 500 fees, it's a, a pretty daunting array of numbers and um, fees for services. Uh, the, one of the primary purposes of the draft cost recovery policy is to provide a framework for you to communicate to the public why fees have different cost recovery levels. Um, not all cities have uh, cost recovery policies, but we think it is best practices for you to consider one. Um, once established, the policy um, would typically be updated every five years. As Jovan mentioned, that's also best practices for user fee updates. 
or uh, the city council has, of course, the authority to um, update the policy when it believes it's necessary. The policy also provides guidance to staff in terms of the establishing of um, different levels of cost recovery um, that allow for uh, response to unusual situations, the pandemic being the most recently uh, um, our, our best example of that. And Anne will talk um, specifically about some of our recreation programs and the flexibility that um, is provided when there is a, a, our parameters to create um, different costs for different recreation programs of benefit to the community. Okay, Javon. Next slide. Okay, um, and the primary purpose of the policy is to, as I mentioned, establish a rationale for the level of general fund tax subsidy of programs, services, and facilities um, based on the type of service and the level of public versus individual benefit. Um, it allows for the expansion and enhancement of services by utilizing uh, user fee revenue to fund those specific services um, related to permit issuances um, throughout your um, city government. Uh, and then it also uh, helps establish a correct price for a given program, um, service, or facility. And we'll, uh, you'll hear uh, later from Tony some examples of different um, fee calculations and how that pricing is established. Okay, next slide. Um, the factors that are in the policy, and we um, tried to keep the policy as um, kind of simple and um, um, easy to understand as possible. Um, we included uh, five factors that go into whether a fee lands in a full cost recovery, medium, or low cost recovery category, and that is community-wide versus special benefit. Um, the service recipient versus the service driver. As an example, a developer or a builder that is coming in and needs a building permit, they are driving the need for that service. Um, that is um, distinct from um, other more general um, uh, activities. Again, mostly in uh, the activities that most of your um, residents uh, are experiencing in the recreation um, and community services uh, arena. Uh, San Bruno residents versus non-residents is a consideration. Residents pay your general taxes, property taxes, sales taxes, um, and non-residents do not. So having a differentiation between non-resident and resident fees um, is a factor when considering um, where a specific fee might drop in your cost recovery spectrum. Um, the availability of the service in the current marketplace um, that also is a factor as you consider if you are offering um, services such as swim lessons uh, that Jovan brought up earlier, um, how you price them depends on whether um, the service is available to uh, the communities. Many of your services are unique in terms of permits that are issued by, uh, by the city. Uh, and then finally, the effect of pricing on the demand for services. And uh, again, I'm referring back to Anne on recreation and community services because many of those um, fees are um, priced based on, uh, with an eye as one of the factors to um, how it would impact the number of your residents that could um, take advantage of those services. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the levels of cost recovery that are uh, in the draft policy um, are three, and um, they also are uh, included in the attachment to the Wildan report. Um, so you're able to look, when you're looking at a specific fee, which category um, the fee um, is proposed to um, achieve, which level of recovery. Um, full cost recovery or near, near full cost would be 80 to 100% of the actual cost to issue the permit. Um, typically, uh, or, or an example of that is a building permit. Um, most of the building, public works, planning permits are proposed at full or near co full cost recovery. 
Uh, medium cost recovery uh, is uh, the middle school recreation programs are in the middle range in terms of um, provides a general benefit that's important to the community and um, the proposal is that there is a subsidy with general fund other tax revenue for those type of programs. And then low cost recovery, um, those um, a senior lunch program in terms of um, where you're not trying to achieve necessarily full cost recovery, you're trying to achieve another uh, important uh, benefit that the city uh, provides to your community. Um, so those are examples in each of those categories. Again, each of the, the fees that are in the attachment um, have a cost recovery level that is proposed uh, in draft form. Okay. Okay, and now we'll have uh, Tony Thrasher from uh, Wildan, uh, who conducted the city's user fee study present. Tony? Thank you very much. Uh, so. I am Tony Thrasher with Wildan. Uh, I'm going to kind of go through the history of the study, uh, what kind of brought us to here, and the methodology and everything therein. So let's go ahead and get started there. So we start off with the cost allocation plan, which was finalized in February of 2019. Uh, so what the cost allocation plan is, it it's kind of it ensures that the central services of the city are being allocated to your operating departments and funds in an equitable manner based off of how support's being provided. Uh, all that's to say, it, it's a tool, right? So we build it in Excel and it goes through and it calculates, takes your central service costs and allocates them out using distribution sets such as full-time equivalents, purchase orders, building square footage, things like that based off of how that support is provided. Uh, so for example, human resources, the number of positions you have in each department and fund dictate how much of an allocation you should get for that central function. The allocations, they should represent how services provided, but it is not a direct allocation. So it by its very nature is, it's not considered a charge, right? So it's considered an allocation of support as opposed to something that's direct charged or determined by logging hours or recording time. Now, cost allocation plans are typically used in the formation of personnel rates like we do here for the user fee study, as well as for budgeting purposes and also for cost reimbursement through big uh, grants. Next slide, please. So the user fee study, which started just after the cost allocation plan in February of 2019, uh, the primary objective of a user fee study is, as it's, it's already kind of been said a few times, right, but is to determine what your reasonable full cost of providing services are. So each, each kind of fee or service is looked at in an individual manner as much as we can to determine what the cost of providing that service a single time is to the user. When that's not possible because say you have a pooled uh, expenditures for a, a program, uh, then we use a programmatic level of, co of cost analysis such as uh, building permits, right? Where you are looking at the total cost of providing service and then you have a methodology for allocating that cost out or spreading that cost out based off of the level of service being provided. <clears throat> Within the model, we determine the, and calculate the full, uh, the fully burdened hourly rates for the, all personnel that are involved with fee services, as well as could potentially be involved with kind of cost recovery. Uh, that comes into play uh, a little bit later. I'll describe kind of how you might use the fully burdened hourly rates for say uh, development reimbursement uh, for your agreements and such like that. Since we're talking about user fee studies and the state kind of the, the state laws that they need to be at or below your reasonable full cost, up to 100% of the cost may be recovered. There is no city I've ever worked with that is at 100% at cost recovery for all their fees or services. Uh, so, but it is a city policy decision on where to set your fees. So figure it's kind of two studies, two studies in one where we talk about these are what your costs are, and then it's a policy decision of where to set your fees. And that's kind of where the draft cost policy comes into play. Next slide, please. So, in developing the user fee study itself, we use a, a lot of different data sets, a lot of different types of expenditure, revenue, uh, your staffing structures. We incorporate the cost allocation plan because that is a part of the user fee study. Uh, and I'll explain that as the fully burn hourly rates and how that plays into it. Productive or billable hours. Uh, so we want to make sure that we, we're accounting for when staff is actually on the job, right? Uh, not when on vacation. 
uh, for the amount of time that they can actually provide services. And we collect time estimates from your staff on how long it takes to provide the services themselves. We're dealing with every department of the city, right, uh, that provides services. And so we're talking to a lot of different people. And so we work with each of the departments and the staff individually uh, to get those time estimates on how long it typically takes them to provide service. Or in some cases where you haven't provided a fee or service recently, it is an estimate. But that still falls under the general practice that, uh, that's used across not just California, but in other states that we do these kind of studies as well. We also incorporate activity levels, revenue. Uh, so if we're doing a programmatic analysis of say your building permit revenue we're look for, or your building permit services, we're looking at the amount of revenue that you've received over multiple years to judge what your cost recovery has been in the past so that we can kind of project where you might be moving forward and what you might need to get to full cost recovery. All throughout the entire process, we work with your staff to make sure that the way that we're using data, the way that we're incorporating the data, and the way the model is built, and, this, and that the fee structures are adjusted or changed, suit the way that you provide services and the way that your cost structures are, and make sure it makes sense for both staff and also for your residents. Next slide, please. So the fully burned now their rates, the way those are calculated is we start off with the personnel cost, and we determine what the salary and benefit rate is for all the positions. And then on top of that, we layer departmental operating costs. So think of pens, paper, electricity, you know, those kind of support costs they need to do their actual job, as well as administrative overhead. So that would be supervisory or administrative positions that uh, go to support their efforts. So think of like direct time being the time estimates themselves, but then the indirect support, they don't have a specific time on the fee, but they provide support, training, that sort of thing. Uh, so that gets incorporated. And then the central, uh, <clears throat> the central service overhead is from the cost allocation plan. So that plan, the allocation provides us with an indirect rate that we can apply to the hourly rates to give us, get us up to that full cost accounting. So in conjunction with the use of the time estimates with the hourly rates, we can determine what your full cost of services are. So fully burned hourly rates are used in the time analysis, right? with that staff time, but they're also used for deposit-based service. So if you have a deposit, then those fully burned hourly rates will be charged against it to recover your costs. It's also used in develop your, uh, developer reimbursement agreements, as well as most other purposes that you might want to get cost recovery through. So it kind of, uh, depending on what comes through your door, even if you don't have a fee for it, you can determine what the cost of services are and, and charge, right? Uh, so. Let's go to the next slide, but actually skip the next one because I left that one in when I replaced it with two more that follow. That was my bad. So the process for the initial study started from February 2019 and went to February 2020, right? And so we start off with collecting a bunch of data. We developed the initial model, and then we have the department interviews where we actually met with staff, right, in person. <laughs> But uh, we went through the cost structure, the, uh, the fee structure, we made adjustments and add new fees, get rid of anything that no longer applies. If you have, say, erroneous copy fees that are things are available online, stuff like that. We collect the time estimates, and that's how we start building on those labor costs and incorporating the cost allocation plan. Through those discussions, we determine what the direct services are being provided, as well as the indirect support, and we layer on that department and the citywide overhead. All that feeds into defining what your full cost of services are, and only after we have the full cost determined do we start talking about where you might want to set the fee, because we don't want to put the cart before the horse, right? So we determine what your costs are, and then we can talk about suggested fees. And that's where we kind of sat with, and it was, it was actually a council meeting in the end of January of uh, 2020, and there was a couple modifications made to our initial report, but that's where it sat and kind of stalled out. Now, next slide, please. So when we picked it back up in December, what we needed to do was to update the, the model and the report uh, based off of a number of factors. One, there's, there was a lot of kind of staff change, right? So we want to make sure that the new staff had their say and to make sure that they understood what went into the model and it made sense to them. So we confirmed the time to process all the all their fees and services, make sure that that made sense. They had changes of their own as well to make sure that uh, new fees were incorporated correctly and adjustments to the structure made sense for how they wanted to apply the fees. We obtained new personnel cost data to make sure that the fully burnout rates were uh, kind of up to current time uh, costs as well. 
And then we, after we had those full cost of services, we went back into that cost recovery discussion where we incorporated the draft cost recovery policy. You have an uh, attachment uh, one, yeah, attachment one before you. And we updated the user fees study, which is attachment two, as well as we added a sorted by cost recovery attachment three, which is easier to view on a device where you can zoom in as opposed to printing out like I had before me, uh, which is hard enough to read that way. So uh, we have all the documents updated here for the uh, for this <clears throat> this council meeting for review. And let's go to the next slide where this is an example of how we do the calculation itself. So we're taking a simple fee, which one we have one person directly involved in providing the service. And so taking the community development tech, we have a salary and benefit hourly rate, and then we apply the departmental direct overhead and then departmental administrative overhead, then the indirect overhead. So you see each of those, per those percentages get applied uh, one by one to get us to the fully burned hourly rate of 144. When we apply it to the permit issuance, which is the fee that we have here as an example, the current fee is $50. But since it takes a half hour of the tax time at $144 an hour, that gives us a full cost of $72.36. And so when we round down to 72, that becomes the cost target for 100% cost recovery. So that's kind of a walkthrough of how that calculation goes through for most every fear service that you have in there, other than like building permits, as well as a lot of the Kind of the, the rec fees which and we'll get into the kind of what happens with those and next slide please so as a summary of kind of some of the main points that come out of our findings going through your cost analysis is much like many cities that we see that haven't done a study in a while uh, you're subsidizing most all of your services there's some that go down right um, but it, due to efficiencies but if you think of like uh, development applications stuff like that the codes always change it <clears throat> it's always changing. So it's always getting, uh, so there's more hoops to kind of jump through to kind of make sure that you're in compliance. And so even though you get efficiencies in some area, some t it, uh, it tends to always kind of creep up on it and making sure that you have other compliance areas uh, in check. And so there's always a give and pull with those, but when you haven't done a study in a while, you, you always kind of end up behind, even if you're using something like CPI to try to keep up. And so as a result, the city is subsidizing a lot of the private benefit services, and that comes out of your general unobligated funds. So the general standard is that if an individual is receiving a private benefit, then generally you want to pass on 100% of that full cost to them. <clears throat> and the reason being is that if you don't, it constrains your, your usual, usually your general revenues uh, so that you have less available to provide for more community benefit type of activities. So, you know, special events, police, fire, that it, you don't have as much to kind of uh, provide for those sorts of things because you're having to subsidize the private benefit services that you have. <clears throat> Sorry, I got an itch in my throat. So we recommend that you establish a cost recovery policy is what you have before you uh, so that you kind of keep up with your cost policies and keep up with your procedures so that you keep up with your, <clears throat> with your user fees. We also recommend that in between full studies that you do have an inflator that you apply annually. The most commonly used is CPI, but uh, there's a number of ones that you could explore as well. But CPI is the most known, it's the most visible, and it's it's most public, so that's why it is used the most. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, Council, I, I will say that uh, if we apply a CPI model, uh, we'll do that annually, and if for any reason uh, by doing that CTI, we become out of sync with what our true cost is. That's why you do the study every five years. So that you're essentially re-baselining your study, uh, your, your, your cost study every five years, and, and, uh, and that's the best practice. Okay, proposed user fees. Okay, so uh, in the recommendations that you uh, have before you, um, uh, there are 556 total fees, uh, and then we, we, we sort of separate it out by category. So 288 are, uh, are, uh, would increase, 13 would decrease, 86 are new, uh, 111 remain at the current rate, 
Uh, 20 are deposit or actual cost base. Uh, and then um, another 38 vary by uh, uh, cuts on, on cost recovery. And so the number in that category are actually in our community services department. And so uh, we thought we would pause right now. We just went through a lot of information uh, and, and ask council if, if there's any questions on what we uh, have gone through in the first 26 slides. And you can, you can still wait to the end, but um, while, while it's fresh, we can, and can go back and, dr and address. Any uh, questions at this time from uh, my colleagues? Uh, Council Member Mason. Yep, thank you. Um, the, C the CPI in the last slide that we just saw, would that require an annual approval then of all the fees um, every year? And who, and I guess who would be responsible for that review? So the city council would be responsible for that, uh, and we would provide a document uh, when you um, are going through your budget adoption process that would essentially list every fee, provide the CPI calculation, list the new fee, and it would be a part of the resolution or a separate resolution that you act on uh, annually. You're, you're muted, but you're muted. I think she's good. Yeah, thank you. Anything else from my colleagues at this point? Not seeing any hands. So we're seeing none. Why don't we go ahead and uh, city manager proceed? Okay. So uh, we want to turn now to community services and I'll turn it over to uh, Ann Matola, uh, the, the director of the department. Thanks, Siobhan. Okay, so um, I'm going to walk you through a number of proposed changes for community services fees. And we wanted to take a look at not only um, some of the fee structures, um, but just the methodology and how we set fees in the department. And overall, what we were trying to do through this process was to um, create a more user-friendly, transparent, and simplified schedule that the public could actually use as a resource because our programs are very um, forward-facing. For facility rentals, um, our recommendations have come after looking at both indoor and outdoor rental fees and discount rates in our surrounding communities. For the recreation program, we're proposing to utilize a cost recovery program model for setting fees, and it's considerably different than the process that we've been using so far for fees for rec programs, and I'll walk you through that as well. And then we also did take a look at the library fees, and we have a few changes that we're recommending for that division. Next slide. Okay, so facility rentals. So staff took some time benchmarking our neighboring agencies because with, with facility rentals, that's still one of those rates that we really, um, it really behooves us to see if we're in line with what our neighboring communities are charging for like facilities. And what we found is that our indoor facilities, um, for the, the indoor facilities, the rental rates were among the lowest um, as compared to similar size rooms and facilities in other communities. While our picnic and outdoor structure rentals were among the highest, and we attribute that to being the first sunny city south of San Francisco, and our sites are always in demand, and we're always to capacity. Um, so when we were looking at the fees, we really didn't want to change the fees so much, but what we, what we thought was important was to propose a way to make this simplified. So when you look at the two um, descriptions stacked, in the current fee rental model, we have five different rates. And we're proposing that we move to three, the, the lower triangle. And so if you were to look at the, the existing current facility rental model, if you were to look at our schedule, we have our city rate, which is always zero, because the city doesn't charge itself to rent its facilities for its programs. The San Bruno Park School District also has fees which are established by a joint use agreement. So therefore, it's kind of redundant, and you have two different documents that need council approval, so they can become out of agreement with each other. So those best practices not to include those in fee, in fee schedules. And so then what's remaining is a non-resident resident and a non-profit rate. So we want to change the methodology and it's a little bit of a psychology of pricing. Right now what we have is um, our resident rate and then we upcharge non-residents and then we discount non-profits. So rather what we'd like to do is to set our base rate. And then off of that, we would have discounts for our residents. So they would always get 20% off of the base rate of the facility. 
and nonprofits would re receive 50% off of that rental for indoor facilities and 20 off of outdoor. And that is pretty much what we do now. It's just kind of shifting the perspective and the psychology of pricing. Um, what was really important is as we were, we were um, looking at benchmarking the actual rental rates, there was a trend and a norm within the peninsula area where nonprofits typically received a 50% discount on facility rentals. In our existing fee schedule, there are a couple of rooms where a nonprofit could have as high as an 89% discount on the rental rate. So we were barely covering the cost um, of, to even have a staff here to open the doors for people. So again, with the facility rentals, uh, the most significant change is the way we present them is to the structure so we can simplify um, what comes next to the top, to the community for renting. Yeah. It's the same concept. It's just community services. Oh, I think it's a duplicate All right. Okay. All right. So recreation programs. So this is a pretty significant. It's a pretty significant change in that we want to remove all of our recreation fees from the fee schedule that goes before council. Um, in the existing fee schedule. We have specific fees adopted by council for very specific programs. So by removing this and by adopting a cost recovery methodology, what we're trying to do is to establish an administrative process, which will kind of create these cost recovery targets, if you will, for the different program types that we provide to the community. And um, we have a chart and we'll take a look at those in just a minute. But the real um, impetus to do this is that it allows staff to have more flexibility in developing programs in response to changing trends with the community. It also allows the department to make incremental changes and fee adjustments to ongoing programs based on changes to cost of service. And I can tell you that even though this is in that category of program that we could exceed the cost for service, we do not. And we actually um, do operate many of our programs at a subsidy. But one of the interesting things too that you may or may not have been aware of over the last year um, recreation has been very creative, very responsive to the changing dynamic in the world because of COVID. And they've been so creative in, in providing um, certain um, free and feed, uh, feed programs for the community to engage in. And we've been able to be very responsive um, simply because we were, as you know, yeah, so, I don't know the right term on that, but. Um, yeah. Due to the emergency declaration, city manager had the ability to authorize those fees. Right. So uh, why don't I expand upon that really quickly? Uh, based on the current structure of our fee schedule, every fee has to be approved. Every every program fee has to be approved by the city council. And so that means you're not nimble. You can't uh, sort of quickly create a program and say, here's the fee based on uh, our cost recovery metric. You have to go to council for every fee. And so uh, during the pandemic, we were able to be nimble and develop new programs, frankly, under the authority that the city manager has uh, because we've declared a local emergency. Uh, and so uh, the new framework has a basically a fee setting model built into it that will allow the department to be very nimble and flexible on an ongoing basis as long as they hit the policy thresholds that council has set. And so it's a way to sort of permanentize that, that, that ability to, um, to be nimble. So this, um, this chart is the proposed cost recovery thresholds for the various program types that we have. And so it's a little bit of a different, of a different uh, data set to look at, uh, because what we're not saying is we're going to start charging um, $125 for a swim lesson. They're categories of programs. So when, particularly when you're looking at um, some of these, it groups in program types. So swim lessons, that range gives us the ability to allow both um, private lessons or group lessons in different numbers within the groups because those all impact the cost for service. So it gives us a lot of flexibility to be able to create programs um, even as audience and demographic shifts occur in our community. Another example would be to look at camps. 
is a rather large, rather broad range on camps as far as the proposed fee range. Our camps can be anything from a very um, a typical um, facility-based week-to-week -week different types of things in class to things which are much more action or adventure oriented where we want to take um, our youth out of the community on different field trips. And so the cost of service for the different camps can range uh, you know, quite significantly. And so we want to be able to have a pretty broad bandwidth in order to create these programs. Um, and I do want to emphasize again that we, we really, um, when we went through this exercise with Will Dan, um, it's a very it's a very detailed process that we've continued to use as part of this process to make sure that our fees certainly were being um, fair and within the proposed cost recovery range, we'd also be looking at what the actual cost of service was. And I also think there's another element about the cost um, the cost recovery policy, which I think is important to mention, that having these ranges would would not allow the um, I think it also would fall within any of the increases would also be subject to CPI. Yes. It's not like it would be, staff wouldn't have the ability to arbitrarily choose increasing fees. And finally, the library. And so when we were adjusting the fees in our facility rentals, we needed to look for like type of programs that we had. So the library does rent their community room. So we wanted to adjust that to align with the recreation model. Um, and also, uh, what's been an interesting trend in libraries is that um, nationally, uh, there's, they're doing away with charges for overdue materials and in our surrounding communities, San Mateo County Library System, Redwood City and Burlingame, they've also have done away with that. And so we're recommending the same. It doesn't preclude us for charging for lost materials and that fee kicks in after 30 days. And there's no change to that fee schedule. Okay, so uh, we can pause here for any questions on the community services detail. Um, and it looks like we have one. Council member Hamilton. Thank you. So with going back to when we uh, talked about the, the, the school district having its own current joint use agreement and um, doing away with that. So would they, would the school district pay the nonprofit rates that we, we saw in that in that list, and will it be necessary to renegotiate this with the district, given that we have an active joint use agreement? So we we are actually nego renegotiating that right now. So it would be in that, and I believe right now the district is zero. Right. Um, so yeah, and, and if it's if, if there is ever a fee tied to it under this proposed fee structure. It would not be in our master fee schedule. It would be governed by that joint use agreement. Got so it. we don't have two agreements that we have to maintain and one be, uh, and, and, and with the ability for them to be out of sync. If we ever have a fee for the district is covered by that, that agreement. Okay. And then I just have one other comment. I, I like the, the, the idea of establishing a, a policy and ranges to allow the, the department flexibility to spin up a new program and not have to wait for us to, to wait for it to get agendized and go through us to um, to approve the fee for it. I would recommend it. I'm sure this is likely going, would happen anyway. That that the council just be kept informed of any new uh, programs that get spun up. And we can just through through the regular updates that that the, the departments give at their regular meetings, just so we know what's 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 happening with these new things that get spun up. Councilmember Mason. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back to the school district um, again. So, if there, if it's going to be governed by the joint use agreement, then will that joint use agreement be finalized by the time that this comes to a vote to the council? I believe the timeline is concurrent. It okay. also be a fiscal year. Okay, great. And then um, my other question is when you mentioned early on that the, that these were compared against neighboring cities, were the actual, um, I mean, a lot of our facilities are quite aged. And so was the quality of the facility also um, reviewed when these fees came into play? We didn't do a rating for it, and, and you are correct in that really the only facility we have right now that we're renting is the senior center. 
And that's why we, are, we really propose no increases to the fees. Everything is, is pretty much stable. Um, but I mean, also to, I saw the swim rates um, and, um, you know, so that's one, one of the examples, but compared to like the Burlingame um, swim rates or Orange Pool swim rates, are they, um, are they, are the quality of our pool the same as the quality of the, you know, Burlingame pool and the Orange Park pool if the rates are going to be similar? So swim, swim lesson rates, typically, it's really wise to keep them, um, keep them very competitive with each other. And part of that is swim programs are one of those things where we look at it as a safety benefit to the community. And so we're not trying to undercut other communities, but keep that within a certain range. Of course, those any of the fees that are related to the RAC will take back, but there's that certain range where there aren't many swim lessons, independent swim lessons that are over about 69 right now. Okay, so um, so they are. I mean, I guess that's what I want to make sure of that they're that they're comparable. We've I know we've been to um, many different swim locations. I mean, this is one of the most important things you can teach your kids how to swim. So um, the rates in other locations might be every two weeks. They might be monthly, um, and so and I will say that the water temperature is very different um, in some places as well, which is a cost to the location, obviously. But I do want to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples, and that's that's uh, that's really my question. Marty, Vice Mayor Medina. Yes, thank you very much. Um, just wanted to make sure I had this right. So these, this study hasn't occurred since 2005, 2006 for, for something of this detail. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, so um, it's, it's not really that surprising that there's a lot of increases. Um, Again, the timing of it is horrible. Um, I, I, I could, I know there's a lot of residents now that are having a hard time. Nonetheless, this is a draft. There's a lot of there's a lot of numbers in here. Um, when when it, how much community input is um, has been taken, um, responses, uh, how much of an impact that will be to um, our community by increasing the rates um, in some cases significantly. Um, so I just wanted to understand so what what input from the community is this is this it right now or, or, or what is suggested suggested with this draft? Uh, so let me take that, and, and I'll actually uh, ask Craig Woodham uh, to, to, to provide uh, additional comments. So uh, a master feed process uh, in, in a, uh, the, the study like the one you have from Will Dan is a technical study that's based off your costs with the methodology that was outlined. And so there is not a public engagement part of that process. Uh, the public engagement for uh, fee updates happen at publicly noticed city, city council meetings. And so this is the first one, and this is intended to be a study session uh, because the, the, the work that went into analyzing and uh, providing these numbers are detailed, and we wanted to have time to really sit down and go through these with you so you can understand them before we put it on a city council meeting um, and, 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 and uh, receive a, additional public comment and uh, have any action by the city council. In addition, in my experience, it's atypical for a master fee study review to uh, go out for public comment. It, it's, it's not like they're, re, they're required 218 processes. These are fees that the governing body decides at their public meetings. And so, uh, Craig Woodham, I saw you uh, popped on your camera, so uh, please offer any additional insight for council. I'm sure I uh, what Jovan said is correct, um, especially uh, at the first uh, viewing of a study of this detail. Cities typically want to get their policymakers to 
provide uh, input um, uh, on the study. And uh, Jovan is also correct in terms of um, user fees um, are often um, reviewed by councils with public notice. Um, and as Tony can um, uh, expand upon, um, if needed, um, councils take different um, amounts of time to review these type of, of studies. But uh, for the most part, this um, analysis is um, provided in as comprehensive a way as possible, and then um, public is uh, encouraged to participate in council meetings to provide feedback. No, thank you for that. I, uh, I guess I'm, I'm interest, interested in uh, the timeline and schedule. Um, also, being aware that um, we will not have a pool at any time soon. Um, so we're, we're going to, we're going to be approving something at some point and we don't have a pool yet. And a lot of our programs right now are, are suspended and hopefully soon they'll be returned. Um, so that was kind of, um, where I was going with that. And I know I'm involved with a number of different groups and, 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 how we can get more information out to them other than just announcing that we're going to have this uh, city council meeting and we're going to raise the fees. I understand the study session. I think it's totally appropriate. We need to be able to dive into this. Uh, I'm just um, interested in the schedule and how and how we get to the final numbers that we're that uh, we're going to propose. And so, Councilmember Medina, uh, the schedule is our uh, 40, 44th slide, uh, and, and so we'll, uh, we'll we we will get there. Um, and with re with regard to your other comment, that honestly, I'm 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 I'm, I'm having a uh, oh programs uh, swim lessons. Um, we. Uh, are still analyzing whether we will have um, an aquatics program while we are constructing the new aquatic and recreation system, uh, building. And uh, we believe that the proposed cost recovery uh, range is sufficient uh, for the interim as well as the new facility because it's a range and it allows us, as the director mentioned, to structure aquatic programs where you have a fee for group lessons a fee for smaller group lessons and then a fee for individual lessons. Uh, and so we, we, we do think that uh, the, the framework is appropriate. Uh, just a note on where we are with aquatic programs, uh, we are thinking about potentially only having swim lessons, uh, but, but not other aquatic programs. Uh, and, and we're looking at that because we know that there's a significant benefit uh, to continuing to provide swim lessons for uh, kids that need them uh, while we are building a new facility. So we're, we're looking at that option. Uh, but we're, we're not uh, ready to announce where we are. All right, thank you. Do we have any other questions at this time? You know, uh, City Manager, I know in the past, it would go before the Parks and Recreation Commission as well, just as far as a, a review, and sometimes the users uh, might not had to do with more of the athletic fields or that fee that was charged uh, for each activity, i.e. soccer or softball or baseball. So um, I don't know if that's something you're still feeling, because I, I, I hear what you're trying to do is trying to streamline the process. Um, but then I, I think, as Council Member Hamilton said, there has to be something where we're still engaged and are, are notified or whether it goes to the Park and Rec Commission um, so that there's, you know, some uh, for folks to come out to, to uh, be able to address their uh, thoughts, concerns, or, or at least have a, a place to sp speak on that, on that process. And, and so that is still envisioned both for this process and the annual setting process uh, for CPI increases. So on, on an annual go forward basis, we will continue to uh, take the park and rec fees to the park and rec board uh, before they come to the city council for that discretionary decision 
on if you apply the CPI calculation that is embedded within your, your fee schedule and your policy. And, and then just it's usually um, reports set a 20% differential between resident and non-resident. How is that? Is that normal practice throughout our county? Is that just uh, how did we get to 20% versus 25 or what have you? Yeah, so when, when we did the benchmarking of the facilities, it was very it was very consistent throughout the county or to the benchmark cities of our surrounding or our cities that touch San Bruno. Contiguous. Contiguous, thank you. I knew there was a word for that. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, any other uh, questions at this time for my colleagues or I'll have them uh, continue to proceed through the other slides? I got it. I saw that thumbs up. Okay. We will continue on. Please. Okay. So uh, I'll turn it back over to um, uh, Will Dan to go through uh, the, or, I'm sorry, this is Craig Whittem. Uh, to go through the proposed uh, uh, user fees and to provide a few comparisons. Okay, the, one of the things that um, we did was, again, trying to provide transparency and um, examples of the fees that are um, common among your departments is to list uh, a number of fees in each department. Um, current fee and what is proposed. So that's what this chart does. Uh, it takes a permit in uh, most of the departments, uh, public works encroachment permit, business license application, uh, use permit, sign permit, um, and um, fire peddler um, in which the police plays a role, and uh, water heater. And um, not surprising, uh, there are um, some significant increases in uh, a number of those fees. Um, uh, but we wanted to be very kind of upfront in terms of some of the common fees and what the cost recovery um, uh, in the draft uh, yields. Next slide. Yeah, uh, you know, it's worth mentioning uh, to the city council that uh, for fees that increase by a significant amount, uh, we have noted their increase over two years. Uh, the city council does have the discretion to uh, make that a longer ramp in um, for some fees, and you do not have to decide on the same um, policy for each. So, for example, you could say, you know what, uh, we are going to allow the uh, use permit for a single family residential property to increase from the 1600 to the 6200 over two years because that is a private benefit item. Um, uh, and um, other policy considerations, but to say, you know what, for the business license application fee, uh, we want that to be a three-year ramp-up uh, because we want to be supportive to uh, businesses that are going through that initial year um, uh, license to the city. So I just wanted to point that out, that there's a uh, policy discretion uh, at that level for you. And I think, I think Pamela is going to cover the um, examples of the individual specific fees? Yes. Uh, Pamela Wu, our Director of Community and Economic Development. Uh, Pamela Wu, our Director of Community and Economic Development. All right, let me see if she is on. Uh, Maybe she has had some technical difficulties. Okay, oh, here she is. Uh, all right, we will reach out to her. Will someone do that for me? Uh, and oh, there she is. Hey, ma'am. Sure. You're on mute. Yeah, Honorable Mayor and City uh, Member City Council, I apologize for my uh, disappearance, but here I am. Um, so I have the honor of introducing and also explaining to you some of the common fees. Uh, as Craig explained to you that we have pulled out, that we'll be seeing a significant increase. So the first one that we're bringing to you um, is the single family user fee. These are the 
neighbors or the members of public when they want to make an addition to their house, uh, want to remodel, um, you know, turn a, you know, a 500 square feet bedroom into a 700 square feet bedroom. So for instance, the chart on the slide shows how many touches we call it um, when a project like this goes through our department. So for instance, the chart shows that when the project like this comes through, the building official approximately spends two hours on his time to review the project. Um, there is no fee coming from a water uh, public maintenance worker because it doesn't go there yet. However, the planning community um, technician will spend about four hours. And the reason for the four hours is for intake to route and also to prepare the notices for the number of public hearing that a project will have to go through, which explains why a planning manager will spend about three hours and a senior planner will take it to the architectural review committee where the associate planner is doing the most heavy lifting to bring the project for decision-making body. Altogether, when everything is said and done, you're looking at about a $6,249 for the actual fee. Um, so what we're charging right now is quite subsidized and it does not reflect the fully burden rate. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the next one is another very common uh, type of application, which is the sign permit. Right now, we charge about $205. So this qualifies for any time a merchant or a business wants to either um, switch ownership, um, you know, when T-Mobile comes to the town, they want to take over a Sprint business center, they, they will come to the city and get a sign permit. Again, the chart reflects how many touches or how much hours, how many hours, how much time a city staff will spend on a request like this. For instance, taking in the application takes about half an hour of the text time, and then the planning manager will review the final approval for about an hour, where the, the planner will be on the call, emailing and explaining, um, and also reviewing the permit for about four hours. So we're looking at about roughly $781 for a fully burden rate. Next slide, please. The next one is pretty straightforward. For anyone who wants to upgrade or replace your water heater, how much does that cost? The water heater fee really comes together with the plumbing permit fee. So the plumbing permit fee is for the intake, it's for the processing. But the water heater itself is the inspection time where a building inspector has to go out to the property to make sure it's properly strapped, it's properly installed, um, all of the connection is properly um, matched. So that equates to about one hour of a building inspector time, which is about $156. Again, that's a three times increase from a current fee. And just because the fully burden rate of the building inspector, um, that rate has increased. Next slide, please. And the very last fee that we want to bring to your attention, again, it's one of the very common fee, business license. Right now, um, the city charges on the average $26 to $36 for a new business to receive their business license. However, if we really look into um, how much time city staff needs to spend, it's about a quarter of an hour for the finance staff to take in, process the check, have them go through the application, and actually the other finance staff to input it into a system, and for the technician at Community Economic Development to enter into track it, send it to a planner for review, and that's what we call the business license. When you said and done, put it all together, you're looking at about $235 for a fully cost rate. Next slide. And I think that goes back to Craig. Thanks, thanks, Pamela. Um, yes, and we did include as um, some of the questions related to the recreation programs and nearby cities. Um, we wanted to provide the council with context in terms of some of the uh, fees as they relate to your neighbors. Um, uh, it's important to note that fees are, it's very difficult to compare fees uh, among cities because there are a number of factors that are, that differ from city to city. The frequency of the fee study, um, great example here where the city of San Bruno hasn't had a full fee study for many years. Uh, personal co personnel costs, um, as pa Pamela just described, are an integral part in setting fees. Uh, they vary from city to city. 
um, different approaches to processing fees. Um, uh, Pamela brought up uh, an example during this process of um, San Bruno will require a couple of public hearings or an architectural review where some cities may not or some cities may have even an enhanced architectural review. Um, and then uh, bottom line also is that cities have very different cost recovery policies. Some cities choose to subsidize at higher levels than others. So with all of those caveats, uh, we can move to the next slide. And um, this provides, again, those same fees where we tried to um, pick out some high volume fees to compare to the neighboring cities. Um, and this, um, these fees were pulled off of uh, publicly available um, uh, websites for these cities. And uh, they, I know that uh, Tony mentioned that a couple of them are in different states of review of their current fee schedules. But we wanted to give you uh, an example of um, these fees and how they compare to um, adjacent communities. Hey, Craig, can I say one thing on that, um, just to put that in context uh, a little bit, especially about the frequency between fee studies. South San Francisco, uh, they went out to RFP in late 2019, and they, as far as I know, are still undergoing a fee study, uh, currently a full cost study. So their fees are also have been just been adjusted annually. Um, they have not actually undergone a full fee study in quite a while. Uh, and then I also know Millbrae, they are in, they were, as far as I know, they're currently still in the process of undergoing a fee study. And I was able to find a public document where it looked like it was taken to a commission, uh, where, for example, if we look at the comparison of the use permit, their range for their actual cost for Millbrae uh, and the preliminary study that they had was between 5600 and 16000 Dollars, depending on the application, they have minor, major, as opposed to uh, you know, single-family residential. But and then for their signed per permits, they range from 3,400 to 5,700 in cost. So they haven't adopted a fee change, but they are undergoing cost data as well. Now, if they don't actually adopt any updated fees, then you end up comparing exactly what they have. So for the most part, when you're comparing, just know. The actual, you know, benefit of a comparison is really this is what they're charging versus this is what we're charging. It really doesn't speak to what their costs are, like in the case of Millbrae, where their costs are way higher, even though they haven't actually adopted the study that they're currently uh, undergoing, or if they've abandoned. Who, who knows? Thanks, Tony. Mm -hmm. Next slide. I think that moves it back to Jervon. Uh, oh, the, the new fees, you want me to cover that? Sure. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, yes, there are um, certain new fees that are in the schedule, and we've tried to highlight those um, by calling them new fees. And there are examples of why new fees would be introduced. Again, the time period since the last user fee study. There are certain services in which the city is providing the service, but there is no current fee. Um, there, in many cases, have been restructuring of services listed where the current list in the master fee schedule just doesn't make sense from the perspective of how the city is processing its fees. Um, and then certain fees were just carved out um, of um, other fees, just again, to try to provide as much clarity uh, as possible. Um, final point, um, and we've been working with Mark uh, on, the, uh, on this project, but prior to city council action, we will um, review a final time to ensure that all the proposed fees uh, ensure compliance with state laws in certain cases, police, uh, um, fees are restricted by um, state law as well as um, a, a, a relatively small number of fees that the city does not have discretion in terms of how much it can charge. Um, and then finally, um, any municipal code amendments that are necessary um, would also be part of the council action when it um, takes action on these fees to ensure consistency there as well. Jovan.
Okay, next step. So uh, our goal tonight was to provide the presentation that you uh, have just received uh, and to receive any input and direction uh, on the information uh, that we provided. Uh, the next meeting is envisioned to be April 13th, uh, a city council meeting where we will consider um, uh, adoption of uh, the, the fees. Um, we would then follow that up uh, with a notice that would be posted on May, uh, posted on May 1st that uh, the fees would take effect on July 1. Uh, we would uh, also, uh, for any of the park and rec fees, go to the uh, Park and Rec Commission. That's not listed here, but, but we would certainly do that because uh, the, the mayor is correct that is, that is our normal process uh, when we are adjusting fees. Um, uh, these fees are implemented uh, by a uh, simple resolution of the council, so it does not require two meetings. Um, and so uh, if um, we, we are here to answer any questions, uh, there are appendices or attachments. Uh, there is attachment one that provides the uh, draft cost recovery framework. Um, that talks about the various cost recovery levels, full cost recovery, medium cost recovery, or low cost recovery. Uh, uh, then there's the fee study, and then there's really the meat of the recommendations that is attachment three, uh, that is a Excel matrix that provides uh, the list of uh, all of the 500 and, and, and some odd fees um, uh, in, in a, a few different uh, categories. But it provides the, the detail on the current amount, the current cost recovery amount, uh, what the full cost is and what the recommendation is and, and what cost recovery category each individual fee is in. And so we know that this is a lot of information, which is why we uh, wanted to have a special meeting. Um, we know that the city council um, uh, may want to look at some of the recommendations uh, and, and, and spread out the increase or uh, move a fee to a different cost recovery. Uh, level uh, and we are ready to engage uh, on that or, um, or 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 just as needed to uh, have an additional an additional meeting. Um, thank you, uh, City Manager and team. Uh, if we have any members of the public that wish to speak on what's been presented, if you could raise your hand and see if there were also any other questions or comments from my colleagues. Council Member Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I, on that last portion uh, where we're looking at, uh, at the fees for the, the permits and things, you know, where some of those get really big, I'm wondering, are we and I know this, all we're looking at is at the costs and trying to recover the costs. And I, I agree with the methodology that was used. It makes sense. But where the prices start getting so high, where people might just stop getting permits, because if I can go buy a water heater for, you know, 400 bucks, and it's going to cost me 150 to get it inspected, am I really going to get it inspected? Um, you know, it, it, we start driving behavior when, when uh, you know the, the prices, uh, you, you know, be, become out of hand like that. And so, I'm wondering if, and I know it would be a different sort of study, but are we going to evaluate whether the way we do things is actually the best way to do them, or are we being inefficient and therefore driving up our cost of doing business because we're not. Uh, allowing more things to come over the internet or more things to be approved, um, you know, in a more efficient manner. And, and maybe that can come at a later date once we, we've established some, some stable financial footing. But, um, you know, that's a concern. I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, if, if, if we're only pricing, thing, pricing things based on the way we do them and not evaluating whether we're doing them right, then we're going to end up with some some numbers that are pretty skewed, I think, in the end. So, so Council Member uh, Salazar, I think there are a couple of ways to address that. Uh, one way is for that particular fee, uh, a water heater permit inspection. Um, the cycle time work of, of roughly an hour uh, of an inspector to go out there is 
you know, uh, probably about right. Um, uh, and that does require a physical inspection the way we do them now. Um, we can decide to move that from the full cost recovery category and to either the medium and the low cost recovery category for that particular fee, because it is something that, um, you know, some of the policy considerations will, that's an emergency thing. Typically, or oftentimes people are replacing their water heaters uh, because uh, it has failed or it's about to fail. Uh, and we want them to, at that moment, uh, come in and, 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 and go through the process because there's a safety aspect there. Um, and maybe full cost recovery is not the policy we want. Maybe we want to strive for a medium or a low cost recovery. That's totally the policy conversation that we can have uh, and adjust that bucket. Because again, a lot of this is based off of the what, what we can legally charge. Uh, I think the other part of your uh, question uh, is, do we have a way to track potentially how many of these we're doing today versus how many we do if we increase the fee to the full cost recovery and see has that trailed off and so maybe the fee is too high? Uh, I think that's a, a larger conversation about our ability uh, in the city to, to, to have the business systems and software in place to track the fees. Um, and uh, we can certainly work towards that. And so uh, totally recognize that as a part of this, um, we, we, we may adjust those categories, absolutely. Um, and I know that uh, this information is one a lot and is two, it sort of requires this meeting to have that detailed understanding um, that we can have the policy setting conversation to move from one category to the other category. And so fully recognize that we may need to answer questions tonight, hit a pause so council can go back and potentially look at those, those the detail in those uh, categories and, and proper recommendations to move uh, fees in between those categories. Uh, and, and, that's, and I'm saying that and do that before we get to the April 13th, uh, where we are um, uh, re requesting action in order to, to have new fees implemented for July 1. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, uh, Vice Mayor Medina? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I didn't, if I didn't mention it earlier, I mean, this is a lot of data, uh, a lot, lot of different fees. Um, so I, I would be in favor of, of coming back um, some some point in between um i i also want to agree with uh councilman salazar if you make the permits so costly people will not get them and when it comes water heat water heaters specifically um if they're put in improperly there it's a major safety hazard so we i would be in favor of improving the safety of our community and not being 100% cost recoverable with that. So, so having that flexibility in that, in that price and, and having a lower price to, to not be, I guess, cost prohibitive. That we want people to get permits because it's gonna be done safely and it will be inspected. So um, the other thing about the same thing with the encroachment permits. I, I remember where when somebody is doing something rather simple and if they're putting in a curb drain and now the, the fees are, was it $600? Is that what it was? I'm sorry, I switched the, the uh, presentation around, but um, it was a hard time getting people to do it six years ago. And, and um, again, it's a safety thing where if somebody puts it in illegally, rips out, rips it out, they're not going to get a USA tag. They're they're going to they're not going to put it in right. It's not going to look good. Normally, it doesn't. So um, I like to see some um, safety considerations there as well um, in in that price and um, such a big increase in our use permits for, for housing additions and, and major remodels. I mean, I like that it's two years. I don't know if 
how how far can we go in in in, in letting those costs um, go up? I mean, they're substantial, and and uh, okay. the last one is with the business license and and um, probably not too many businesses are not are going to go. Oh, I'm not going to pay that. I mean, that's what they need to have, but um, it's it's definitely um, we need to do something about it. And, and here we are again, you know, trying to catch up and uh, cover our costs. But we're in the middle of a pandemic again, right? So I, I repeated that, but it, it's reality. So. Um, I'm looking for I think we should come back and and and, and take another look at this um, we got the presentation um, earlier today and um, I, I think we need more time to I need more time to look them over and and have a better understanding of it so those are my comments council member Hamilton thank you so um I, I was really surprised to see how much higher some of the, the fees were once got once you know, first to, to see how much they jumped and then to keep going through the packet and then see the comparison against other cities. So I was um, very thankful to get that extra color hearing about, you know, that both South City and Millbrae are in the process of updating their fees. Um, and I understand why you can't put in what they're what they're proposing because it's not because it's not finalized. But it would be helpful to know, you know, the, the, the comment was that South City hasn't done theirs in a while, and we didn't know where, uh, in quite a while, and um, and we don't know how long ago it was that Millbrae did theirs. If it's possible to get that information, that would be helpful, because if they're in the same boat as, as we are, where they, they've been ignoring this for 15 years, then it would make a little bit more sense. We're looking, the data would make a little more sense that we're looking at here, because right now it doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. Unless they're just severely um, or, or very much uh, um, subsidizing their fees. Also, I have more, but I'll go ahead and answer that one. Thank you. I see your hands up. So I can uh, definitely answer that one. I went back to look at, they annually adopt their fees, and it is always just a minor adjustment. Uh, so going back uh, longer than you have. So I don't think they've had a comprehensive look at their fees in quite a while. Uh, I, I find no record of one uh, through available council documents online. So and that's both Millbrae and South City. Uh, that would be South City, Millbrae. The um, it's a planning commission re report that I found that public document that was in 2019. So they may have completely shelved it. I don't know, or they could be in the same boat as you as well, and just waiting to uh, readdress it once it comes up. Okay. But all right, and then um, looking at the, the example of the sign um, permit, and I'm just using it as an example because it's it's the old, the, but I would imagine this might be true for some of the other fees in the schedule. Um, the other the other cities have ranges while we have a fixed, and I'm wondering, you know, just again, I'm picking on the sign example just because that's the example that's there, but, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't the amount of work needed vary based on, what's being asked for you know if, if i if i'm putting up a non-lighted sign stuck on the front of my store versus a you know freestanding lit from within you know it, that sign that's going to require new electrical and a bunch of other things i would imagine that the amount of staff time for those two items would be quite different and is it and you know should we consider ranges for some of for not not for everything in the schedule of course but for some of the ones where it makes more sense I can take that question, um, Councilmember Hamilton. We do have a range, um, but it's just the majority of what we do falls under the very generic name of sign permit. So for other jurisdictions, they may have a sign replacement permit, um, a sign upgrade permit. Uh, for us, anything that falls into that category, they come in for a sign permit. We also have something called a master sign program, a sign deviation, a sign variance, um, which is not you know, a sign permit, but most of our work falls under the sign permit category. Okay, so we do have a range. It's just a, it's just a categorization. Um, That's difference. correct. Okay, good, good, good. Thank you. And then my last, um, my last comment. Uh, I want to echo what um, what Council 
what Vice Mayor Medina was saying earlier about just the difficulty in getting through all this data, would it be possible to share the, the, um, the Excel file from attachment three so that we can, you know, kind of parse it and um, engage with it a little bit better than trying to scroll through a, a PDF? Um, that would be really, really helpful before that to help us process all this data for the next meeting. We'll do that. We will um, lock the equation cells um, so that if you're doing sorting, it's not corrupted. Uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but I want to type in all my own Ds, Jovan. <laughs> we'll, 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 certainly, we'll certainly do that. Thank you. Councilmember Mason. Okay. okay, thank you. So um, I just, first, before I, I'm going to ask a couple questions, but I just do want to. Um, Thank uh, Director um, Wu and Matola. These are kind of your first meetings, and you're coming at us with some pretty big increases. So I just want to thank you for your professionality coming to us and you know presenting these items. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions around the increases. So the first one is, um, can you let me know approximately how many peddlers we have in San Bruno, and what uh, who is a peddler? That's exactly why we have the police chief here. Uh, I don't know if he'll be able to answer exactly how many peddlers, but he can provide some information. Yeah, sorry, are you guys able to hear me? I was having some difficulty on muting. Yeah, you're good, Chief. Okay, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Yeah, I can provide a brief answer to that question. Um, I don't know how many peddler permits we currently have issued. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm ill prepared in that regard. But a peddler is defined in the Muni code, and these uh, refer to people who are traveling door to door or from place to place within the city, uh, peddling goods, whether they're um, selling goods actually that they're carrying with them, like um, even someone going door to door selling vacuums, um, or someone who is uh, soliciting donations for a particular cause. So peddler permits are required if you want to travel door to door throughout the city or business to business and attempt to, to sell or, or purvey any kind of goods or services. Thank you. And would um, someone like the ice cream guy at the park, the you know the woman who's got fruits going down San Mateo Avenue, are they going to be a peddler or a business license? Yeah. So I, I would defer here probably to the city attorney to define it more clearly. But my understanding is there is a separate designation for mobile food vendors okay. that is different from uh, peddler permits, and it's governed by a separate process. Great. Thank you. So um, I'll go back to the city attorney, city attorney Zafrano. So you know the the people that we are that we see that we buy from in the park uh, downtown. I, I'm just trying to figure out how much how many ice cream paletas do they have to sell at two dollars to make up their license or their fee. So where where would they fall into place? Um, in the, the, the ice cream vendors in the park are classified as peddlers. They are. I, I believe so. Yes. Okay. And what about the um, the? Uh, there's a woman who sells uh, for. Those are the probably two most popular people I see in, in San Bruno, and she sells them down San Mateo Avenue, um, and in the park as well. Would would that vendor be considered a peddler too? Probably so. I'm I'm just not familiar with with what they're doing, where they are, and if they even have a permit now. So. Okay. Um, Assuming they told me the truth, they have a permit because I, I asked. I was curious about the process. Um, so, so I, I would say. What kind of permit they had? Um, I did not ask. That's why I'm asking what the difference is now um, between the two. So I, I will ask. Uh, so um, there is a difference, as you may remember, from our duty provision having to do with food vendors and so on. So I'd actually we sort of need to know if we're going to answer the, kind of a specific question like that. What, what are they selling and figure out what category they're in. Okay, great. So um, I would just say that I think it would be good to have that information. Um, I, I only know because I've purchased from them, but it would be great to really understand the impact. Uh, how many people are we talking that are actually going to be impacted by this, and is it really worth it um, to really change um, whether we have this, which I call it a benefit in San Bruno, to have uh, individuals selling things in the park that otherwise, you know, as of right now, the snack bar is barely open. Um, and I think it's just really nice to have that uh, both in the park and in downtown and throughout the city. 
um, it's a significant increase in the amount of money that they'd have to make in any certain month or year to be able to pay this, in my opinion. Um, the other, and I'd like to know also, I mean, when we talk about the impact, we've really talked a lot about equity this year. Um, so really who is, who is being impacted by this peddler's license and uh, is it truly an equitable um, increase when the city may not really benefit a whole lot from it? Um, my next question is around the business licenses. So um, the business licenses, how often does somebody have to renew their business license? So business licenses are renewed annually, um, uh, but I, I want to uh, point out that uh, we are not talking about um, business license uh, fees, uh, which are actually taxes, um, uh, as a part of this uh, master fee process. Uh, there may be a inspection or some other uh, service that is required uh, for someone receiving a business license, but we're, we're not talking about business taxes through this process. And does the city currently know who's up to date on their business license? So we do have data. So um, we do have data on who is behind uh, on their business license, um, uh, if they've had one. Um, I think part of your question is, do we know if every business in the city has a business license? And that's, that's sort of a, a, a slightly different question. Um, and and that there, there's, a, there's a process behind that. There are even firms that will come in and do an audit based on uh, Nate, um, Nate's uh, industry codes and registrations at the state and things like that. Um, we have not engaged in that process as of late. Um, but again, we're not talking about business taxes here or business licenses because those are those are technically taxes. Okay. Um, okay. So, but as a, as of right now, then there is some kind of list that we have as a city to know who's not, I guess, who's not up to date on their business license or who's not current. We do we do know who is not current on their business taxes. Um, uh, if they have had a, if, if they have paid their taxes before, or we have some record of them operating in the city. Um, there are a number of ways that we identify businesses um, that do not have a business license, um, um, and that is likely interfacing uh, with other city departments. You may not get a business license, but when you go to turn on your water service, um, uh, there's a cross-reference and a cross-check, and, and, and so there are ways to triangulate. Uh, what I would say is that some, some of the hardest businesses to track are the home-based businesses um, that may not get a business license. But, but there's a separate uh, process and uh, one of the um, things that we uh, have talked about and we'll be looking into uh, within the finance department, there, there's changes to our business license process. We currently process in-house. Um, uh, there are companies that will process for you and that have developed specialized systems to go out and identify people that do not have business licenses. Again, it's a wholly separate topic than, than user fees. Okay. Um, and then for um, the other issue with the business license, uh, and we don't have to go in, into detail, but I just want to throw this out there. Um, I know uh, I've spoken with city attorney Zeffrano about this, but we're looking at an increase of the business license to 235. And right now for something as simple as our, u our utility boxes, which are wonderful art pieces, I think, to our city, we're paying artists $750 and we require them to get a business license. So they would actually be taking 235 off of that $750. Um, so the, I, you know, so I, I think we just really need to um, think about the impacts and hopefully we, we actually remove that. And that's part of the conversation that, that I've been uh, having with city attorney Zeffirano. Um, the other question I wanted to ask is, I know from my time at the Planning Commission that a number of the plans that come in, I, I can't remember exactly at what point, but it's contracted out. Um, so some of the fees that were mentioned, will they also be covering some of the consultant fees? Um, is, that, is that part of the goal and part of this calculation? Director Wu. Um, I 
probably will look into um, the Weldon folks to do a better explanation, but um, the fees to pay for the consultants are covered based on their proposed um, rate. So whatever the consultants, they're basing their hourly rate. So if the scope takes 100 hours, um, the fee will, will we charge us to pay for that scope. Mm -hmm. so, so, it's, so the fee, what's before you is the city staff fee. So whoever city staff is working on it, then we'll charge the city staff adopted master fee. But the consultant will also be charged um, um, based on the consultant's fee. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, That's thank correct. you. And then um, my other question is around the, the whole single family homes in particular, because it looked like that was like a five, five times the, an increase in what the current costs are. And it honestly just kind of makes me um, wonder, I understand that we're trying to align ourselves with other cities, but that is a, a pretty steep um, increase in it. And as we just went through our zoning, our zoning code update, it kind of gives us perception. Do, do we want people to do things legally here in San Bruno and make sure that everything is safe? And, um, you know, I worry because the council, I think, has, has expressed um, concern over, you know, both code enforcement and building inspection and receiving metrics around what the follow up is. And, you know, here we are substantially increasing these fees potentially. And um, for people who are trying to do things legally or maybe complaining about people who are not, there is um, there is a perception that the follow-up is still quite slow. Um, and we don't have the metrics to see, okay, if there is a problem in the building process, um, who's gonna come in to you know, address it? And while I get that some of these fees may be going to, you know, get more staff, and which I think is, is a huge need in pretty much every department, um, I'm just trying to figure out if that's if that's appropriate. It's a huge increase to people, and we really are trying to say, look, here are all these new zoning rules. Look, we need more housing. You can build junior ADUs and regular ADUs, and you know we've got all these all these new um, initiatives to encourage housing. A lot of it mandated by the state, but then we're also significantly increasing the cost. Um, I, I mean, I'd like to maybe hear from the consultants how how this has really rolled out in other cities and whether you know if there's been an uptick in illegal building um, to determine, you know, how that might impact us here in San Bruno. I can touch on that. Uh, so where typically you see the non-compliance is with residents, right, uh, as they do improvements to their own homes. Uh, if you're talking about developers putting in, say, new homes, you really don't see much of that happening because you have to go through the whole process. Uh, user fees are typically not cost prohibitive to developers at all. Uh, they're, when you're increasing fees to them, their usual response is, am I going to get service quicker, right? Uh, if there's been no case where, say, an expedited fee at double the rate of what the current fee is put in place, that they don't use. So it's, they're more than willing to pay extra in order to have quicker service. That is always their primary goal. So the impact fees uh, generally are, they look closer at those, um, but even then uh, that's part of kind of the building process and making sure they have a community that kind of supports what they're trying to put into place. So these are kind of along the same lines of as long as that they're sure they, they feel assured that they have, they're getting the service that they want, then the fees are typically aren't that big of a concern. Uh, now there are cases, you know, further down south, actually I'm in Temecula, right? Um, but so there's certain places in the desert where they're trying to spark development where that's not always the case because there's a lot more mobility. Um, but kind of up where you are, that isn't as much concern at all. So I usually don't hear much from the development folks up there along those lines. Um, but uh, it is always something to keep in mind. But in this case, your fees would not be cost prohibitive compared to others that I see. While you do look at your your kind of couple of neighbors there that haven't done fee studies in a while or haven't enacted those fee studies, they have lower fees. But when we do these cost of service studies, the fees that you have in place are quite typical. And are they, um, if I may just ask for clarification, because maybe I'm misunderstanding, the, this, the, this use permit single family residential, it would only apply to developers or is, or is it gonna apply to any single family home um, in San Bruno that needs a use permit fee? 
I'll, I'll take that question. I'll take that question. Um, okay. So the single family home C, uh, conditional use permit is only going to apply to the homeowners, um, a homeowners who are making a major remodel to their house. Could there ever be a developer? Of course. There could be a one-time small developer who wants to buy a fixer-upper, demolish it, and build it up. So they could be selling it, turning it over. That could be a developer. But the majority of the people using that vehicle would be a homeowners um, trying to make an addition to your house. And I kind of want to go back to your original question, Councilmember Mason, about how come the fee is going five times. Um, the fee is only calculated based on our current process. And I remember when we're taking taking the zoning code update to you last Tuesday, we explained to you that this is a long overdue effort. Um, and, and keep in mind, that's not the entire zoning code. We only touched upon the area that reflects the TCP, the housing element. There's still a lot more to be done. Right now, um, if you remember from your time being planning commission, uh, a, a homeowner who wants to build a 500 square feet addition have to go through two rounds of public hearing, two rounds of staff report, two rounds of um, and public notices. Is that a notice, is that a process that's still akin to today's regulation? Probably not. So at the time when staff has time to amend that section of the code, we could then amend the cost associated with that application. Possibly if it doesn't have to go through architectural review permit and it does not have to go to planning commission, but it goes through another design review po possibility, that the, then the overall cost will definitely come down. But right now what you're seeing is based on the current staff involvement. Okay, um, okay. Understood. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and then um, as far as just the, you know, I just want to echo, I think, what some of the other council members said, which is I just do worry that the time, that the timing of this is not great. Uh, I know earlier at the beginning of the pandemic, we had been informed that there had been an increase in um, construction projects at home because people may not be working um, or they're working remotely. So I, I don't, I'm, you know, just very uh, hesitant around the timing of this and some of these just seem uh, really quite, quite high as far as the increases go. Um, so I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Council Member Hamilton. Just one, one uh, follow up question from what, what we were talking about earlier. Um, comparing fees to other to other cities, would it be possible to you know expand the circle a little bit and you know look specifically for another city you know as close as possible on the peninsula that maybe completed a comprehensive fee study in 2020, and then use the you know and then do some comparisons there? Um, because you know, for example, if San Mateo completed theirs last year, it, understanding that they may have a different uh, a different policy um, for um, for fee recovery or whatever you know with all the, all the other caveats that we heard I, st I think that would still be helpful if that's if that's available I would be surprised if we found that you know nobody has done a comprehensive fee study in 15 years just like us I would be really surprised if that was true so we can um, council member we can research that and, and get that information to you thank you Uh, just uh, a couple things. For hours. I'm they're sorry. The mayor. They're the mayor. I was going to say they're probably waiting for hours. <laughs> um, real quick. So nobody likes uh, having to tackle this, and it's uh, not fun and not easy. And a lot of these costs are to bring up to par us getting back the monies from developments. And that we're having burden, burden meaning all the costs of the employee, not just the hourly wage, because the taxpayers pay for the whole burden, which means medical, dental, retirement, et cetera. So th this, this is uh, one of those things, and it's not about actually acquiring more staff. It's just about uh, being reimbursed for the time that is spent on some of these tasks. And on the, on um, the peddler versus this versus that, I and mean, we just did uh, Title IV. I think it's uh, section 4.1 something, 6, 8. Uh, so we want to make sure we're consistent. We just updated that with the state laws, what's permitted, what's required to be followed. So um, I think we need to be consistent with what the policy and practice that we've already uh, adopted and updated uh, in Title um, 4 to be consistent with state and, uh, and our current norm. 
Is there any other um, questions or comments from council? Um, city manager? Sure. Uh, so we, I want to thank the, the city council and uh, we walked in here tonight and, and um, uh, we knew that this was a, a very detailed presentation and some of the recommendations for full cost recovery, um, we knew that there would be robust conversation around uh, and uh, additional process uh, behind deciding exactly where does the city council want to fall on in your policy framework? So let me just say that that's normal, that's appropriate, that's expected, so thank you. Uh, what I also want to do uh, in sort of stepping up on the balcony, if you will, is one of the things that I think of the thread through the conversation that I heard is we haven't uh, had a comprehensive uh, update of our fees in 15 years. We know that our fees uh, are significantly lower in some areas, and we are uh, greatly subsidizing um, private benefit. But we also heard maybe going to full cost recovery is not where we want to go right now, and we, we want to have additional conversations around what are the policy um, items around where we have, uh, where we want to say, you know what, for public policy, uh, reasons we want to subsidize this recreation um, uh, fee or that recreation fee. And when we look at development, we don't want to sort of raise the fees so high that one, we push away development, or two, we uh, make it cost prohibitive uh, for our, our residents to take out that, that fee. But at the same time, so, so there's some happy medium between where we are and full cost recovery. And I think that's the that that's the mission before us um, to see where 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 do we want to fall. Um, and there's been a number of comments about uh, looking at additional data, uh, looking for a neighboring city uh, in the peninsula that has uh, recently adopted uh, a fee schedule and remarketed their fees. Uh, and we can certainly do that. Um, specific to development review, I know council knows this, but I think it's worth repeating. One of our challenges, because uh, unfortunately our fees are uh, so much lower than our cost, is that we're resource constrained. And we're, but we're also really busy. And so we do not have the funds to actually provide better service because our fees are so low. But yet people are saying we're frustrated that you don't have the, the staff to process uh, and to move faster and to give us um, um, the ability to, to move through your system faster. And so it, it's sort of a, a, a chicken and the egg question or you can't uh, sort of have one without the other. Unless we say, you know what, we're gonna keep our fees uh, at their level and we're gonna apply additional general fund money uh, to, 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 um, to subsidize and, and, and continue to subsidize more. Um, so we have better service uh, both for our residents and, and, and development. Um, and, and so that is a policy option uh, that is before us. Um, and one of the things we know certainly with new development is that the amount of the fee is not always the question, it's sort of the, the service uh, and the timing of the service. And, and so we know that sort of having some of, some of the lowest fees hasn't meant that we had more development, right? And so um, we, we, we need to sort of find that happy medium and, and we'll work uh, with your schedule uh, and develop a process by which we can continue having these conversations. Um, from, from my seat as city manager, I do think that if there is a policy directive that we can land on, uh, it is um, of critical importance to the city's fiscal health um, that we do that and our ability to provide services that the community, both the development community and our residents that are doing improvements to their homes, frankly, are demanding and deserve. Uh, and so if, if we can uh, come to a recommended policy framework uh, in time to rebaseline uh, some of our fees for July 1, I want to uh, keep working toward that um, uh, because I think we all know it's long overdue. Unfortunately, you know, uh, it's a challenging time and it's going to require a detailed policy conversation on which of those fees we want to rebaseline. Uh, and, and which of them we want to sort of make a policy decision on to say, you know what, not right now, or a long ramp in. 
Council Member Mason, you have your hand up. No, through the mayor. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to say before we end that I don't I don't think it needs to be extreme than either or. I mean, we have funds coming in that we all are aware of. We have heard the plant department that they need a management analyst. We've heard community services. We know the police have had vacant positions for some time now. I don't think the council is opposed to any of that. And I think we just want to know all of our options. Uh, but I do want to be clear, I don't think it's an either or situation. As we go into budget season, it would be great to really understand what, what's going to be coming in uh, and what we can use of that to really enhance our departments. Um, but I think when this comes back, one of the one of the issues I want to just raise that would be great to be answered is what is really the scope of those impacted. So I asked tonight, how many peddlers, how many business licenses are we talking about? You know, uh, these these areas, how many how many people have single family home applications in right now? Um, it would be really helpful to understand the impact of these changes. Um, and then what are alternate options? Is it just two year? Is there a five year phase in option? Is there a four year phase in option? You know, how, how can we all um, get to get to where we need to be? Um, and then the other side of that is if these uh, increases should go through and um, you have uh, you're inundated with applications because people are trying to get everything in while the fees are low. Do we have the staff capacity to handle that as well? So um, those are the two areas that I would love to hear about when it comes back to the council. Thank you so much, everybody who, who worked on this tonight. Okay, I'm, there's been no, uh, nothing from the public at this time and I'm seeing no other hands up from uh, colleagues. So uh, to all that are here and as for the last few hours, thank you your patience as uh, we didn't begin quite on time and thank you for your uh, patience and our closed session went a little long like I said but with all that said um, we are going to go ahead and adjourn to the next regular city council meeting which will be held on March 9th 2021 at 7 o'clock via Zoom. Everybody have a good evening. See you soon. <laughs>